primarily in the southern Andes in northern Chile, northwest Argentina, and in many other places. Central and, Peru. No, and <laughs> Central Peru with his work on like storage and uh, in Huanaco Pampa. Extraordinary work there, right. Anything else I should mention? In Jauja. In Jauja, right, right. <laughs> okay, it's close. Right, so uh, Terry's... Terry. Que dulzura. <laughs> right, so oh, his talk you. is the dynamic formation of imperial knowledge. Terry. Thank you, Jeremy. Can we just the mic again? Yeah, could yeah. someone uh, down the... Yeah, I think back there they're doing it. Okay. Um, so welcome back, everyone. If you want to take your uh, post-perennial nap right now, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Horn Graduate Center and all the people who organized this conference for the invitation to participate. Um, and uh, I would like in particular to uh, thank Gary for including me in this group and uh, want to congratulate him on the publication of his enormously ingenious and insightful book. Uh, it's just one of several that have both informed us about uh, Andean life and thought and have moved us forward in interesting ways theoretically. Uh, I've benefited greatly from the work of uh, many people in this room today, not just Gary, but Frank Solomon, uh, Sabine Hyland, Bruce Mannheim, and others. <clears throat> and uh, I need to acknowledge their work, but I should say that uh, I'm not sure if the best way to put this is that I have built upon their work, drawn from it, or just directly pirated it. Uh, but thanks anyway. So uh, this is a uh, talk about not kipu, not kipu knots, but about, about not kipu, all right? Uh, and in part, this is because I'm a bit of an interloper here. Uh, pretty much everybody else in the, uh, in the group uh, knows much more about the particulars of kipu study uh, than I do. I build, I study, I, I work uh, from their research. Uh, so I think the, I figured the best thing to do would be to cite them extensively, and then they would find that harder to find fault. <laughs> so let's start out. Uh, I'm going to go all over the place in this talk. Okay? We're going to be looking at very, lots of different places. And I'm going to start out with uh, somebody I greatly admire, Nate Silver. Uh, in, the beginning of, in the beginning of his book, The Signal of the Noise. How many people have read this thing? Yeah, OK. So he's got this wonderful quotation at the beginning that says that books had existed prior to Gutenberg, but they were not widely written and they were not widely read. Instead, they were luxury items for the nobility, produced one copy at a, lot, at a time. He goes through the high cost, transcription errors, and so forth. This made the accumulation of knowledge extremely difficult. It required heroic effort to prevent the volume of recorded knowledge from actually decreasing, since books might decay faster than they could be reproduced. The pursuit of knowledge seemed intentionally futile, if not altogether vain. There was nothing new under the sun, as the beautiful verses of Ecclesiastes put it. Not so much because everything had been discovered, but because everything would be forgotten. Um, well, no. Okay. Uh, but there are certain challenges to working with knowledge that is not in a, uh, in a book format. Uh, so what I want to do is try to put the kipu into a larger context, not just an Andean context, uh, but pre-modern in a comparative sense. And I'm going to go a little farther, far afield here. So I'm going to start out with uh, the Code of Hammurabi, okay? which is, as everyone knows, the world's fourth legal code written down. Okay? Shulgi came before it, a series of others. Um, and so this is one form of, uh, trans um, of transcription of knowledge into a written code. This is cuneiform. Uh, there's a recent book that just came out from a uh, colleague at uh, Columbia, Mark Vandermeer, who has written a book called The Philosophy for the Greeks. And take note that this is written from the perspective of a historian and epigrapher. Uh, so he's talking about the, the Babylonian theory of knowledge, the philosophy of, of existence, of governance, of human relationship with, with the cosmos. And he writes, the Babylonian theory of knowledge was to an extent empirical. Observation was crucial. It was also fundamentally rooted in a rationality that depended upon informed reading. Reality had to be read and interpreted as if there were uh, a text. Do we hear Ian Hodder in here, a little echo? Uh, just like Descartes, the Babylonians knew that senses can deceive and that observation alone is not enough for knowledge. They had a method of finding truth. And if they had any doubt about their own existence, it was removed by the knowledge that they could read to understand it. I read, therefore I am, could be seen as the first principle of Babylonian epistemology. 
So there's a sense, at least from a, a historian's perspective, that text was how one understood knowledge in the context of Babylonian society. But if we go just a little bit more and draw a bit from the work of uh, my colleague uh, Zena Bahrani in the art history department uh, at Columbia, she points out that the uh, inscription, the trilingual inscription of Darius at Bisitun, uh, which allowed the initial uh, translation of uh, of Cuneiform by Rawlinson uh, and Hink and a whole series of other people. Um, what she points out here is that the, uh, the writing and the image uh, were consubstantial. Okay? They were both necessary for the full interpretation of the other, and they did not work individually as well as they would work if they were together. So the writing informed and legitimized the imagery, and the imagery enacted and vivified the text. And you needed both, even in a society that we think of as, uh, where we think of literacy as being dedicated to cuneiform. In fact, there's a substantial unity of document in a textual form and in a graphical form. So I'm going to go now to quoting another person. This is an apocryphal individual invented by uh, Terry Pratchett. <laughs> and this is introduced what I'm going to do in the talk. Okay? He says, uh, science is nothing but a series of questions that lead to more questions which is just as well, or wouldn't be much of a career path, would it? <laughs> so we've got a lot of questions and not many answers. But what I hope to do is provide some useful lines of inquiry into how we can put the kipu and other forms of knowing into uh, an interactive context. So we go back to the Andes, the four parts together, or the, what was it? The partners that in their foreignness make up a whole. I'm going to have to put that in there. All right. Um, what I'm interested in is how early empires, especially the Incas, devised a philosophy of governance. And I've, I've, I've broken things out in various sort of categorizations for the purpose of exposition here. Uh, but I'm, I'm arguing that the Incas and many other societies, many, many other early empires, really conducted two parallel and integrated imperial projects. Uh, one of them was concerned with the organization, the trajectory, and practice of imperial governance. So it includes things like conquest, incorporation, construction of infrastructure, politics, militarism, economics, resettlement, and ethnic relations. This is basically what I spent the first 25 years of my uh, career working on. Uh, the second is what I've been working on for the last few years, uh, and that is the intellectual project, which consists of civilizing the world through imposition of order. And this, here we're looking at how there's a, uh, a philosophy of governance, of logic, and the legitimacy, in this case, of Inca rule. So if we want to start to look at the, the second, at this intellectual project, we have to deal with a whole series of antecedent questions. And I'm gonna, you're going to get too many Daezu blue slides here with questions on it, but this, these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about, and I'll, I'll try to integrate this as we go along. So some of the essential antecedent questions that we need to deal with are, how do people recognize, categorize, or classify things of their world? We know that all societies don't do it the same way. Uh, so we need to get some sense of how is, uh, how is the world abstracted and presented? Okay? And then how do they consciously atomize those, those into discrete, understandable elements? How do they choose to represent those elements in discourse or in a graphical sense? Which do they choose to represent and which do they not? I'm going to come back to um, a lot of what I'm interested in is what's not there in a material sense and why that's so important for understanding the constitution of knowledge. Uh, and then we need to take on questions like, is the representation graphical, spoken, sonic, performed, or something else? And then do people present or represent things or ideas? That is, do they assume that there's something there that could be given out, or do they have to abstract it and uh, put a filter through it? That's, this is some of the stuff that I think Bruce was talking about a little, bit, a little bit earlier. So my next slide I would not have put up if I had heard Bruce's talk earlier, but here we go. Okay. So here we go. So um, some there's some basic kinds of symbolic representations. I put up three here. There are other ways uh, we can do it. Uh, we can talk about uh, semasiographic, quantitative, and linguistic representation. I'll give examples of those. But otherwise, we can break it down. But a semasiographic representation will give us a meaning-based system, not necessarily related to a linguistic or a sound-based system. 
It may have something thought of as a grammar, uh, include, may include things like mnemonotechnologies. Here I, I draw uh, on Frank Solomon's work where he talks about um, the uh, semantiographic content of, of uh, the kipu, if I'm not mistaken, I'm reading that right. Uh, pictography, notations, tokens, things like that. A uh, quantitative approach provides uh, representation, provides data, numerical uh, representations, temporal representations. And a linguistic, which is language-based, is intended to represent a linguistic or a sound-based system. I don't think I'm contravening you here, Bruce. Um, may have a grammar and a syntax and may ultimately produce uh, a result in writing. So if we look at some of these kinds of representation systems, we go back to 27,000 BC. We can interpret that there's, there's meaning built into this from the Altamira cave paintings. Um, there's also substantial amount of meaning built into these sorts of things. You know, we're all familiar with these sorts of things. You know. They can be read out across different language systems. They can be understood uh, simply in their visual format. Uh, the death of Christ uh, here is, uh, represents a, th that's one graphical way of representing it. We can represent exactly the same thing that way. Right? There is a cross which represents the crucifixion. So there's a multiplicity of ways of conveying complex ideas that are not linguistic. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is try, trying to understand how people in the Andes might have incorporated in this into their material culture or their performance or other elements of their lives that were not in the kipu. Also, you can go to Japan and you can read the road signs, okay? even if you don't speak Japanese. We can codify sound without explicit language. We can codify sound in ancient Egypt. That's Egyptian musical notation. We can codify movement, choreographic notation. We can codify space and action across space. This is a Menard's famous graph of Napoleon's march to Moscow and that beige and the tiny little section of the Grande Armée that came back after the uh, winter in Moscow. We, we can also look at space through a whole host of other kinds of charts, like an aeronautical chart. All of these convey very complex kinds of information without necessarily having a language structure built into them. They can be read out in a lot of different languages. We can also do time. Right? And some of these kinds of uh, temporal representations in, in graphical formats will uh, can have a very uh, strong emotional impact. Uh, for those of you, including me, who are in kind of the older echelon here, look at the upper left-hand representation, right? What is that? It's a life clock. 84 is the average age of death, okay? Yeah, right, I don't want to look at that one, okay? Two kinds of mathematical notation. Third one. Right. So there's lots of other ways of recording information that take us away from uh, Nate Silver's original formulation, which is if it's not written down in books, then the knowledge can't be presented and preserved. Kipu is one way of doing it. But there, there are just thousands and thousands of ways that people can do this. We can look at cladistic models in uh, uh, in taxonomies in uh, in biology, there's lots and lots of different ways that we can do that. Uh, so one of the questions that I want to ask is, was there a set of principles that guided and re, uh, the design and use of various sorts of places and things where information was recorded? Not just kipu, but architecture, other kinds of material objects. That is, as Gary has argued from in his book, The Social Life of Numbers, things such as kinship order, um, the order of the uh, shoots uh, or the, the um, uh, little individual ears of corn, um, textile weaving, all arise from the same order, uh, ordinal order of a mother in a genesis of for thereafter. Right? So is it, can we look at the material record and perhaps performance as well to the degree that we can understand it? and get an understanding of uh, some fundamental set of principles that guided more than one thing. We're going to come back to this right at the end, if I have time, to talk about the relationship between the structure of the kipu and the architecture at Inkawasi, arguing if they were 
conveying the same sort of information or basically registering the same thing and talking to one another or if they were both shoot offshoots of something more fundamental that was expressed in two different ways. I want to, I want to think about things that way. Okay, so um, one of the things that I mentioned I'm going to come back to again uh, is uh, what changed with the Incas. Okay. Things were not the same in the registry of information in the Inca Empire as they were in antecedent Andean societies. For instance, Moche portrait head jars, which, which are characteristically thought these days to have been individual portraits of people, perhaps of aristocratic status. Okay. You don't get these with the Incas. Okay. You don't get an expression of narrative scenes, such as this two-tiered two register of um, the sacrifice of individuals down at the bottom with their blood being caught in goblets, kept suspended in liquid, liquid form by the uh, Yuchu, not Yuchu, the, um, uh, yeah, the Yuchu, yeah. And then being presented, that goblet being presented to the individual in the top left there. We don't get that with the Incas. Nor do we get things like this, like the Wari Greenstone figurines. Uh, nor do we get anything like this. Here we're going to go to Mesoamerica, Aztec land. <coughs> and I, I, I put this up here not just because it, is, it represents a calendar. The Incas did not have a calendar. Right? They didn't have anything that recorded the, the periodicity of the years, going from one year to the next and the next. When the Spaniards talked to the Incas, nobody could tell them exactly how old he or she was. They didn't keep track of that. They kept track of cycles, but they didn't keep track of a series of uh, calendrics over a long period of time. So what we have here, this is the uh, Codex Cospi, uh, there's 65 of uh, 360 days here. Um, there are a couple of ways of looking at this. One of them is that this is a, an accounting of the days. That's kind of the standard way of doing it. Uh, James Maffey, who's written a fascinating book called Aztec Philosophy, uh, has argued that what this actually is, is a user's guide to the self-revelation uh, of Teoc, which was the matter energy that uh, made up everything in the cosmos. So Teot was something that was constantly transforming itself and taking on different forms. And those forms would be presented to the outside world through masks. And so what you needed was not an accounting of that, but you, wanted, you needed a guide to understand how the Teot was going to self-reveal itself in different forms on a cyclical basis. So it's a slightly different take on what a calendar is. It's not an accounting of a list of things. It is what's coming up next and how do we know it's gonna, how it's gonna perform itself. How's the cosmos gonna present itself? If we go to something slightly different, you get great celebrations of the self, Ramses um, at Luxor. Oops. And we get Augustus the God. And of course, Augustus the God in the Arts of Peace, where in the upper register there, what he's doing basically is showing the lineage from the genesis of his family up to the present day and tracing it back to the founding of uh, uh, Rome with Romulus and Remus, which is presented in another face. So essentially what you have is a, a visual argument for the legitimacy of Augustus as the ruler of Rome. Now, let's look at the uh, analogous thing, materials that we have for the Incas. So I'm going to start out with known portraits of Inca royalty. Um, we also have the uh, architectural representations of Inca personages in murals and inscriptions. And finally, we're going to include the constructions memorializing the achievements of materially identified Inca royalty. It's gone. Or it was never there. The question is, why not? They had the portraits in the Mozart. So what we're, what we're getting here is a, a different kind of configuration of the presentation and memorialization of knowledge and why. What's the question? And I think it has to do with a, an alternative way of partitioning knowledge uh, in, a, in a sense that the, that knowledge is active and potentially dangerous. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, they weren't entirely bereft of representation. So we find here at the... Um, one of the royal palaces in Cusco, a couple of serpents, uh, which were a maru. That's on the outside of Hatun Cancha. And then at uh, Wanaco Pampa, a puma, 
uh, which may have, those actually may have been signifiers, uh, heraldic signifiers of particular rulers. Okay. We also have anonymous representations in gold, sweat of the sun, silver, uh, tears of the moon. But we don't have statuary that actually says, this was Pachacuti. We don't have 35 representations of Pachacuti with the same face. Um, so, now we come another day of blue with more questions. Right? Um, so, we want to ask, what constituted knowledge among Andi Andean peoples? What was accepted as knowledge? What was open for multiple readings? Or contestation and revision? How did novelty arise? Right? How were new assertions legitimized? Right? We know things changed. How'd that happen? That's what I'm trying to get at. And then we get, okay, evaluation and transformation. Right? Who had the right to propose a new idea? Okay. Um, how did people get into that status? How did the ideas move, how did the Incas move ideas from a state of novelty to a point at which they could be discussed, to being a naturalized part of the canon, to actually being part of the framework uh, that uh, people could um, people could use to analyze other novel ideas. Uh, okay, so let me see here. L let me go. Yep. Yeah, all right. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there's several places where this was manifest. These where knowledge was manifest in Kipu, in narratives in public performances, in memory landscapes, in visually distinctive built environment and material culture, and things could be transformed through physical acts of violence. Essentially what I'm arguing here is that knowledge was an, it was an emergent property of dynamic relationships. It was constantly being reformulated. And it was constantly being, um, let's say history, what was the sequence of rulers, for example, was something that was constantly contested, often in very bloody ways, and there was a resolution of the, uh, of the contestation and then a discussion over actually how we got here. So let me keep going with this just a little bit. I have actually have 15 pages of notes for this talk. I was only gonna give four, but then what other people earlier said, I gotta throw in a little bit more, okay. Um, so, let me put one more thing here. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we often think of as having uh, encoded information. The uh, Tokapu textiles um, on the left and Inca ceramic uh, designs on the right. So I wanna ask a, a question. Um, if knowing in the Inca empire is knowing how to do, which is very often how they expressed it. There wasn't any sort of idealized knowledge. It was knowing how to do things, knowing, knowing what and knowing how to do it. Um, then does the interface between humanity and the landscape and history provide the means by which both humans and landscape could be disciplined into doing things in the correct way? In other words, did, did the Incas try one of the, the intellectual elements of their work, of the, in, of the imperial project was to discipline people and to discipline the land. Because both there were both human and non-human residents of the land, the Runakuna and the Tirakuna. And so that the Inca project was not simply bringing order to the people, but making the people and the non-people cohere to the same framework and act in coordination with one another. Um, that is, is architecture itself both a disciplining force and a mediating agent intended to help bring the cosmos into a unified order. Okay, in other words, we want to be asking not just what do people do at sites, but what do the sites do to the people? How, how does that work out in practice? Um, so let me elaborate this a little bit. So if people move and see correctly, will that, will that civilize them? because the architecture induces them to do so as an essential part of their living. This is a bit like Foucault's disciplining action, that if you structure space and movement, you structure knowledge. And what you do is induce people to act in a particular way through their own choice, or their own inculcation of what those norms are, uh, because the structure of the environment as it's been set up is a way to bring social order to people and provide an interface between that social order and the what we think of as the natural order. Okay, so let me go back here for a second. 
Okay, now we know that a considerable amount of information that was present in a material form in predecessor societies readily disappeared from public view under Inca rule. So we saw the human likenesses, the events, and the processions. <coughs> so what I'm suggesting here is that Inca knowledge was, in a very general sense, could be partitioned into three domains. That which was represented in material form, that was left in the in an intangible form, and that which was performed. I'll slip in categories for this in just a moment here. But let me talk about those categories for just a moment here. Okay, so the material domain, what does it do? It provides a structure, a spatial order. It provides a framework for argument. It provides a means of relating social and cosmological orders. So basically, it, it gets people to act in particular ways because they're forced to move and see things in particular ways. And this is part of why you have, I think, an aniconic form of representation in the Inca uh, built environment. What they're basically trying to do is structure interaction rather than to represent interaction. Okay? Uh, the intangible provides a context for, for dynamic arguments. So it has to do with power, history, genealogy, and legitimacy. And the resolution in the intangible domain, which I'll talk about in a moment, is used to construct a collective memory. So what happens if you have, I'll just give you one example here. Um, if we think about the election of a pope, right, there's a lot of fighting that goes on in the Vatican for a period of time, for days. And they come out then with a puff of white smoke and there's acclamation about who the next pope is. And it turns out to have been an Argentine, which is great. He came in second, second the previous time. Um, but that is presented as a unified front on the outside when there was a lot of debate that went along, went, went on in the inside. And I think the, in, the Inca presentation of order and history went through the same sort of thing. There's a lot of infighting in Cusco among the royalty, a lot of killing that went on, and ultimately you get a resolution. And one of the ways that you, um, that you make that resolution into truth, into knowledge, is by getting people to perform that. They collectively act in performances that, that uh, put the new ruler into place, and then you reconstruct history to fit that new order. So performance then provides the epistemological ratification, and that includes things like ritual and speech acts. So let's look at this here, okay? So um, what's in the material domain? Built environment uh, that crosses over a bit into the performative. Uh, objects and textiles uh, go from the material to the performative. Processions, rituals, and prayers are slightly crossed over too uh, from the performative. Uh, and then the genealogies and collective memories are the kinds of things I'm thinking about in the intangible. And you'll notice the quipu in the center there. So, so let's look at this. So we've got, what we've got here is Machu Picchu. That's a built environment that mediates between humanity and things that are outside humanity and also structures people's activities within it, their movement, their lines of sight. We get processions, like pilgrimages, koyoriti, uh, that guide people through ritual pathways that reinforces their knowledge, membership, and the order of humans and the landscape. Textiles, tokapu up there, which I'll come back to in just a second, um, which are objects. Uh, people talk about tokapu as they, they may be heraldry. Some people have gone so far as to say, uh, that these kinds of images uh, could actually be a grammar. Um, I'm on the side of, of folks who don't see it in such liberal interpretive ways. Uh, as Tom Cummins has pointed out, there's no place in any of the documentary sources where the Spaniards are talking about registry of uh, information um, where they talk about Tocapu in that form, whereas they do do that with the Kipu all the time. They talk about calculations with the Yupana. So the Tocapu don't enter into that conversation at least insofar as I know. Uh, and then if we go to the other one, okay, so the genealogies. Uh, here I have this represented as a descent of the kin and, and the, uh, uh, the descendant kin groups. And uh, this gets reformed every generation. Right? So there's part of it, in, uh, there's an intangibility to this. Now what is the one thing that, that ties this together? Our friend the kipu. Right? What the kipu does, at least in, in one reading of this, is it's a material thing, okay, which cannot be used unless you have the intangible knowledge that goes on with it. Okay. 
but that is instantiated through the performance of the Kipukumaya. That is, you need all three of those in order to bring the knowledge to fruition. So the, the, what I see here is that the different ways that different domains of knowledge and their subsets intersect with one another provide different ways of knowing and reinforcing uh, what the world is about and what, what knowledge, what information is recorded in it and how, could it be, how it can be played with. So who's involved? There are lots of different agents active in the cosmos, human, celestial, natural. Uh, those elements operated in an experiential, active, and relational terms. Um, I, don't, I can't, don't have time to go into detail here, but I can field questions later. Uh, now, this is built on the work of, of Frank and Gary and um, um, Marisol de la Cadena and Kitty Allen and a whole host of people. Uh, that humans, resources, and environments shared a mutually constituted social space. And the social entity consisted of the people and the land. It was, it was a unified entity. So the landscape is both a social place and a repository of history. They're not separable. So we get human beings having a social relationship with the landscape, the living mountain. Distinctive stones were the owners of the fields in which they stand. And space-time was unified. So this is representation of Armada time, where the individual stands in the present, the future is behind him, and the future passes through the present into the past. So what you have here is a land in which you can interact with the past and perhaps even change it, because the agents that have died are still alive. They're still acting, they're still thinking, they're still contributing to interactions in the notion of reality. Here I draw from um, Frank's work, and please uh, um, yell at me if I get this wrong. But the um, life force, Kamaken, is constantly passed into living things, either by constellations for the Yamas, or by humans from the mummies, the ancestors. So the reality is constantly being reinstantiated, constantly being recreated and knowledge is in that context. So where are we? Non-humans, non-humans, and objects can all have agency and knowledge. The past and the present can interact. Existence is con continuously emergent, and knowledge is therefore a dynamic process. Knowing is at least partly knowing how to do, and it is continuously created, inscribed, and performed. I just want to talk very briefly about Perfect, okay. okay. About kipu as objects. We think of kipus as repositories or registries. But here we have, a, we're in a Gothic cathedral here. We've got the Bible there, okay. Now, it's probably the case that nine out of 10 people who went into that church couldn't read that Bible. But they knew its potency. That Bible would be performed in front of them. Just the same as the Tupicocha kipu are performed without people still being able to read them. So we can think of kipus as objects of power, even for people who didn't know what was in them. <laughs> if we go to the landscape, I'm saying that the landscape can act to shape people's activities. So let's take very, a very quick look at Saxo-Aman. The throne of the Inca, which is located right there. Uh, the chronicler Kobo wrote that uh, the entire structure, the entire design of Saxo and Mom is built around this set of um, stones, carved stones here. And right out the left side there, there's a seat where if you sit in the appropriate place in the central part of Saxo Amman, right there, that's what you're interacting with. Hausangate. And a student of mine who finished his thesis a couple of years ago studied carving and water at Saxo-Amal and found any number of carved seats that were all looking at Ausangate. So the structure of carving is designed to promote knowledge exchange between the people and the land. We can also look <coughs> at how the people uh, used stone to interact as a vivified force where we have, this is uh, the Torreon at Machu Picchu, and as uh, Carolyn Dean has pointed out, the living bedrock was considered to have life force. 
stones could be alive. And so she argues that architecture of this form was a bit like grafting. It was like building a living form on top of a living bedrock. So archi architectural construction here is actually like planting a crop. And if we look at other ways of interacting, we get the carved stones at Machu Picchu, which communicate with, promote communication at Mount Yanantini. Okay. What we're doing here then is looking at a way in which architecture and sight lines were being constructed in such a way as to integrate the knowledge between the human and the non-human parts of the landscape. So a few very quick questions about the Kipu to wrap up. I want to ask, did the Kipu record reality, or did it help to create an aspirational reality? And what was registered in the Kipu, or what could not be, or should not be? In what ways was knowledge partitioned in those particular ways? And Gary and I have talked about this a little bit, um, I think with Bruce too, and that is, um, was the Kipu consubstantial with its contents? That is, if we have something like Wama Palma's 10 Roads of Life for Females, was the recording of those people on that kipu in fact incorporating part of those people in the kipu? Were they fundamentally linked in a way? So the wasn't, kipu wasn't simply a register, that you could act on the kipu and it, the kipu would, would then act on the people. And if people did not behave the way the kipu said it was supposed to, then it was the people who were out of order and not the kipu. So let me end with two brief quotations. Uh, thank Bruce for the translation here. Uh, it's Kecho Pomba, the creator god of Viracocha. Sun, moon, day, night. The season of ripeness, the season of freshness do not simply exist, but are ordered. I think what the Incas were trying to do with their uh, the structure of knowledge was to integrate human and non-human land into a single entity and provide ways of communicating within that framework. And then, because I don't have many of the answers to all those questions I posed, we go to the Water Chiri document, thanking Frank for the translation. And so long ago, when beginning anything difficult, the ancients, even though they couldn't see Viracocha, used to throw coca leaves to the ground, talk to him and worship him before all others, saying, help me remember how, help me work it out. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes for questions here, comments. Yes. I'm very scared to venture to ask a question about, mm -hmm. about this philosophy, but I was struck by your, at, towards the end when you talked about the seats at Sacsayhuaman and yeah. how, yeah. and the, you, I'm assuming at Machu Picchu you have to be standing in the right spot to see the outlines of those stones that line Absolutely. up so well with the mountains. And it seems like a lot of this philosophy and knowledge production is rooted in an understanding of perspective and relational perspective and how it depends on where you're standing, either in time or in space, or maybe within the social structures, how the world is created for you. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to invert that. You're going to what? Invert that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say, and I'm venturing out here in dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the, uh, the Incas would not have seen it as a question of perspective. They would have seen it as how is the how are the non-human elements of the landscape guiding your position? So essentially, they are directing you rather than you finding a place where you can see. <laughs> do, you see, do you see why I'm inverting that? What I'm saying here is that from an Inca perspective, knowledge and agency are not vested just in humans, they're vested in the other stuff as well. And so it's an interactive relationship to just say, say okay, I, if I line myself up here, I can see that. And it's another thing to say, if those things line me up, I can get it. And I think maybe both of those are intended. So your, your question is perfectly legitimate. That's it. We want to do the mirror question, too. Do you think that it's part of our inheritance from the 1930s sort of fascistic notion of how the Inca conducted themselves that makes us less likely to, I mean, that seems like a very humble position. You, you're, you know, you're moving yourself in relation to the world rather than trying to force the world into your 
Mm -hmm. Viewpoint. No, you're not moving yourself. The world is moving you. That's what she's saying. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I think the, the Incas saw the world as being uh, jointly organized between the human and the non human vivified beings and powers. And I think the, the Inca enterprise was intended to unify those under a single rubric of order, which they, they positioned themselves as being the central element in, uh, in, organizing, uh, in organizing things, keeping the non-human in line, and uh, essentially making themselves the necessary difference <coughs> between all important elements of cosmic order. Okay, thank you very much, Terry. We should...